Okay, so for reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, the collective abbreviation of that is, is ROS, they have two primary functions. One of them is as a second messenger, and then the other one is as pathologic mediators. And there's two types of this, or two classifications that we could have of the actual species themselves. There's the radicals, and then the non-radicals, but they're peroxides, so they'll end up just generating radicals anyways. Um, one of the most common ones and one of the most reactive ones is called superoxide, and this is just basically diatomic oxygen with a radical attached to it. The hydroxyl group as a radical. If you remember your organic chemistry, this should all be review. And then nitric oxide, which is, whoa, that's an electron, by the way. A nitrogen with one electron on top of it. We also have hydrogen peroxide and peroxy nitrite. Uh, just abbreviating the generalized structure of a peroxide is this. Uh, so in this case, it's a nitrogen. In this case, it's the hydrogens. Between the two, doesn't really matter. They're going to end up generating radicals either way. Okay, so we all know about common colloquial sources of reactive oxygen species, right? Irritants, carcinogenic compounds, smoke, smog, UV rays, pretty much anything that's going to form a radical. But there's also cellular sources, right? The mitochondria is one of the primary sites of oxidative phosphorylation, so it makes sense that this guy would be evolved in producing reactive oxygen species. But there's other sources for, for this stuff as well, like for example, cyclooxygenases um, or lipoxygenases. And if you remember, a while back, people were talking about, um, a popular science writer was talking about that if you take aspirin, if you look at the data, people who take a daily dose of aspirin are correlated with lower amounts of cancer. And one of the proposed mechanisms for this was the reactive oxygen species. Anytime a popular science writer is writing about something, I'm always kind of skeptical, but it's, it, it kind of makes sense. But I'm always the first person in the room to, to raise my hand and say that correlative does not mean causative. But, you know, anyways, there's NADPH oxidase, and this is one of the very, very well understood forms of redox signaling, which is where we're using a reactive oxygen species as a second messenger. But if you think back to my immunology videos, or if you haven't seen my immunology videos, respiratory burst is a phenomenal novel mechanism by which neutrophils and macrophages get the job done. And one thing that's more common in neutrophils, and neutrophils have a shorter lifespan. So, you know, it's nitric oxide, I'm just going to put the radical there because I want to. Um, this is one of the most important, I think, signaling cascades for understanding uh, how we can regulate blood flow locally. And we'll talk a lot about this when we get into the cardiovascular system or when we start talking about the smooth muscle, but this is just a generalized overview of its signal transduction pathway. Um, so for example, this is acetylcholine, which just plays a role in relaxing the smooth muscle. Um, generalized you know, stuff that you probably already learned about, phospholipase C, diacylglycerol, IP3, um, ultimately results in activation of nitric oxidase synthase, which we're gonna take arginine, and we're gonna convert that to nitric oxide through the use of NO synthase which is a wonderful name, right? NO goes on and activates a cyclic GMP pathway, which results in activation of protein kinase G, uh, which literally just mirrors PKC, um, and ultimately this results in smooth muscle relaxation. And again, like I said, we'll talk more about that when we get to the cardiovascular system. So this is another picture um, from your textbook, and I, I hate it. I really don't like it for multiple reasons. One, they don't include the radical on the superoxide, and then two, they don't even show the goddamn first messengers. <laughs> they just, like, it's so irritating to me. Um, so let's just talk about this real quick. This is an example of redox signaling, and this is the first messengers, which are not shown, consist of vasoactive factors like endothelin or angiotensin, cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, growth factors, but also just physical shear stress. Remember, physical pressure can cause a conformational change in a protein as well, and this plays a large role when we talk about the cardiovascular system, when we talk about the pathology behind an MI or a stroke or things like that. So don't get too bogged down on all the details of all these wonderfully named proteins that I'm not bitter about at all, um, but just focus on this, what's happening here. So these proteins down here, ROC, P65, and P47, these guys are involved in activation. Activation, right? And just for reference, if you want to, just pause the video and read this little figurine down here. But these guys are involved in activation, and these guys up here, the GP91, NOX1, NOX4, P22, the NOX makes sense. Everything else is not a helpful protein name. But anyways, this guy up here, this complex here, this is the catalytic site where we're taking diatomic oxygen, we're converting it into superoxide, and then from the superoxide, we're gonna go through this long series of events, um, which ultimately results in the formation of reactive oxygen species, which do more than just cell damage, which we've already talked about. They play a role as second messengers, which is why these things are a part of 
all these cascades that are involved in this. And that's why I, I really hate this picture. But it's from your textbook and you gotta, you gotta work with what you got. Is the fact that the mitochondria is a node of reactive oxygen species. And there's are two pictures here that show just the multiple, multiple complex steps in this. And some of this may or may not be familiar if you remember uh, from your, from the immunology videos, but NF kappa B is a huge, huge important uh, transcription factor for a lot of things, in this case, inflammation. But also ARE, which plays a role in uh, antioxidants, enzymes, which is, this is kind of just the, the linear pathway showing it here, but I kind of like this one better because it, it shows how these things works, okay? So for, you may also remember IKK, which is a part of NF-kappa B as well, which is gonna result in acetylation, which is gonna result in expression of inflammatory genes. And also though, when we have reactive oxygen species being produced, this plays a role in production of antioxidant genes or to, that's gonna make enzymes that are gonna catalyze those antioxidants reactions that we talked about way, way, way back at the very beginning of this video series. Okay, so this is another diagram that I found online, and I like it because it just kind of shows an overview of all the types of reactive oxygen species, and it differentiates which ones are highly reactive and not. And so if you look like right here, for example, you'll see peroxynitrite, and peroxynitrite is listed as a highly reactive species. The hydroxyl radical is listed as a highly reactive species. This is showing the NOx pathways that we had talked about, and all this other stuff here. And I guess this is the point that I'm trying to make here is that oxidation is a driving force in evolution, and it really is. And I, I think that uh, not just not just in terms of endosymbiotic theory, not just in terms of protection from uh, oxygenation of Earth's atmosphere, but we, I mean, just look at all the things that this is involved with, right? It, it makes your, you know, you're more metabolically efficient after endosymbiosis. We are protected from the massive entropy onslaught of oxidation, and Along with that came all of these wonderful novel signaling pathways. And, and one of the, the, the trends that you need to know, I guess, in terms of, of evolution and of natural selection is that the more precise signaling you can have, the better you're gonna be at dividing up labor. And that's why these two things here, like lifespan and then differentiation, right? The better you can divide up your labor, the better you can have more precise signaling, the better you are at your differential reproductive success. That is where structural complexity comes from, right? And so that's why I'm just blown away by this. I would love to do like, like half, you could do your entire PhD in, in, in the biochemistry just of, of mitochondria, your entire PhD in the molecular evolution and the significance of the mitochondria. You don't need to know this entire pathway, but just understand that it's complex and it plays a very, very unique role in signaling. And so one of the things that's really important, or I guess helpful at least, is understanding that the way that it works as a signaling pathway is usually by acting on proteins, but also on lipids, right? Just how phosphates can act through kinase enzymes on proteins and lipids, redox, reactive oxygen species can act on proteins and lipids. And so that's what this picture is showing, and usually it's through this, the thiol groups, the SH of, of cysteine here. So this is showing kind of just the process of oxidation and reduction happening around those thiol groups. Very, very interesting stuff here. Oxidative stress is a concept where the balance of reactive oxygen species production and degradation is kind of thrown off whack. And that's what, it's kind of a collective term just to say that the body's under stress. Um, so what are some examples of enzymes that we can produce to protect us from uh, ra reactive oxygen species. Well, there's superoxide dismutase, which again, I didn't include the superoxide there, which takes oxygen, superoxide, sorry, converts it into hydrogen peroxide, and then catalase, which takes hydrogen peroxide and produces it into oxygen and water. That should hopefully be familiarized with you. Antioxidants such as vitamins, E, C, whatever, right? Linus Pauling thought he could live forever by taking a lot of antioxidants, but there's actually a, a limit to how much of that we can absorb. But why do we do this? So what is the, the important of this? Well, this two things. One, this protects us from overstimulation of pathways and the oxidative damage that accompanies with it, right? Reactive oxygen species do not care what they oxidize, right? They will mess up your DNA and they will mess up your proteins if they're given the chance to. This is, plays a large role in understanding the signaling cascade for apoptosis, which I'm going to give its own unique video. And it's correlated with correlated with many, many, many more modern uh, first world diseases, like in autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases, Alzheimer's, cancers, a whole bunch of other things that we're gonna talk about later.